Hey, fatheads and pipe dummies, welcome to another episode of Pipe Dummies. This is episode nine with special guest, Soy Milk is Good, aka in a human form, Josh. I am your guest co host. You're used to seeing Rob, I'm your guest co host, John, the cigar surgeon. Here, as always, or at least the last two times, with your host, the MFN CEO, Logan. Oh, Logan, what's going on, brother? Other than Callaway being sick, which we talked about, and then going to be out of the country or not home like for the next six weeks traveling and stuff, it's awesome. Life is good. You're a you're a busy mofo, man. Like <clears throat> you you laid out your schedule for the next couple weeks, and it's crazy. Six weeks, it's crazy. I know. Well, hey, it's what I do, and that's what you do when you work for a corporate juggernaut. And I'm not talking about Cigar Federation either. Uh, <laughs> gotta make those ducats. You gotta make those dollars, man. If they tell you to go, you go. Only thing I gotta say is it is it is nice just being able to have status when you fly airlines. I forgot how bad it sucks to be back in coach and like middle seat. I don't even know what that feels like anymore. And if I had to do that international to India, I'd seriously probably like just kill myself. Murder death kill one eight seven. It would be horrible. But enough about your schedule, uh, Josh. Thanks very much for joining the show. I appreciate you uh, you kicking in and hopefully uh, making us a little less dumb. How you doing? Uh, good. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, this, this should be fun. I look forward to it. Um, you know, I've talked to uh, you know talked to you guys a little bit on uh, on Reddit and whatnot, but it's good to finally meet in person. Absolutely. Well, let's give everyone just a little bit of background. I want to tell everyone how I met Josh. Like I, you know, I, I visit Reddit every now and then to, you know, do my occasional trolling, and I found this great sub. Like, you know, before I, I didn't really know where to go for. I mean, I sure as hell don't come to Pipe Dummies to learn about pipe tobacco because we don't know shit around here. Um, but you know, I've been looking at you know tobacco reviews and some other sites, and I found you know our pipe tobacco, where Josh, aka Soy Milk, is good, uh, is one of the mods there, and you know. Was bought a few pipes from him, asked him a few questions, bounced a few ideas, and asked him to come to the show. So if you want to learn a little bit about pipes in a good community, definitely check out our pipe tobacco. It's much better than our cigars. I just said it. Okay. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> Ouch. It's true, though. It's true. You don't get yelled at. And I've really? had some dumbass questions. It's funny because I started out at our pipe tobacco... Um, back when I first started smoking at the beginning of, like, 2012 or so. Um, and then I just got really hardcore into cigars. I just, like, really dove into it for a little while, for about six eight to eight months or something like that, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and then I, I don't know, I somehow went back to pipes, and I just rediscovered all my pipes, and since then, it's been mostly pipes for me, and my cigars are, you know, I still maintain them in the humidor and whatnot, but I mostly smoke pipes these days. I don't know. I'm I'm just holding on to my cigars thinking it'll come back at some point. You know? It will. I mean, and that's the, what I, I think the beauty about pipes and cigars is, like, there's not too many hobbies that are, like, interchangeable. Do you know what I mean? And Like, where you can bounce to one fluidly, and, like, to me, it's becoming where, you know, I smoke definitely more cigars than I do pipes, but... Like, the interchange is similar, and I can see the crossover. There's a lot of people that are making that crossover, so you'll be back on the sauce. But i got to ask you, I have you on the air, and you can't lie about it. You, How many pipes do you have? Because you're always selling or trading um, pipes. Like, Do you have, like, did you, like, get willed, like, 20,000 pipes, or did you knock off Savinelli, or, like, what happened? Where you got so many pipes? Um, well, I, you know, I've been collecting pipes... Uh, for a couple of years, no, no, I guess now at this point, like maybe three years, um, and for me, um, I have about a hundred of them, I'd say right now. Nice. Um, and to be, to be honest with you, I know that sounds like a big number, but for people that are hardcore collectors, that's nothing. That's just the beginning of a collection. Um, and so I have. You know, from a couple corn cobs to pipes that are cost you know hundreds of dollars or whatever, um, and yeah, it's just been I don't know I I kind of gone through phases like when I started out obviously I started out with less expensive stuff and then I kind of find my found my way to Instagram or whatever and that whole community um, and started buying some stuff from carvers that are, were over there and then I started going on to 
kind of more high grade stuff. Um, so I guess as with every step step along the way, I found there were pipes that I was leaving behind that I wasn't really smoking too much, um, and that were just kind of sitting around. And uh, so I thought, why not just try to sell some stuff to uh, to help pay for you know to get more tobacco and more pipes. Um, so it's it's some of those things and some stuff that uh, I found on uh, you know some. Craigslist lots, you know, I live in New York, so there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of people trying to get rid of pipes around here, or uh, I got one lot from a guy in Georgia um, that uh, our friend, my friend Dan Nemitz, uh, who runs American Pipe Makers, um, tipped me off to, so that was, you know, I sold all those pipes and kept a couple for myself, so... It's just, it's kind of all different places. There isn't really, like, one place that I get them from. Uh, yeah, I guess okay. that's... You know, that's I didn't know if you had a beat at, like, the local flea markets and, like, have the market cornered and you were just picking them up on the cheap. But w let me <laughs> ask you a question, because you brought up a really interesting point. Like, the whole point of the show and what we're doing, I mean, obviously Cigar Federation is pro cigars, and that's what we know. But we're making a bridge into pipes because a lot of people are kind of can make that bridge. And you talked about how you went from you know a couple of corn cobs up to you know buying you know Dunhill pipes maybe right. But like the problem that I've had with cigars, I learned this lesson. I started with a 25 count humidor, then it was 50, then it was 300, and now I've literally got you know a 1500 count tower and three Tupperwares just stocked full of cigars. <laughs> So where's a good place to where you don't have to make with pipes? Where's that sweet spot where you can come in and make an investment, but you're not really wasting your money, right? You're not buying like a fifty dollar, sixty dollar Rossi or you know Dr. Grabos or whatever that crap is, and then you're just not going to use them. Where's a good place to enter in pipes where you can be happy um, and still get use out of the pipes? Um. See, that's a very difficult question because, um, and it's actually talked about a lot in the pipe world, um, and uh, it's what's a reasonable price to pay for a good smoking pipe. And uh, if you interview 10 pipe smokers, you'll probably get 10 different answers. Um, and the problem is, is that, you know, there are people in the pipe collecting hobby that make millions of dollars a year. Uh, there are people in the pipe collecting hobby that make minimum wage, or you know, our students that are making even less than minimum wage. All right. So uh, it's like it's not with cigars where you know you can enjoy one of the most. I mean, one of the not the most expensive cigars, but like a, a premium, really high quality cigar at the top end for the most part is maybe like thirty bucks, forty yeah. bucks, something oh, like yeah. that. Uh, but a top end pipe can run you into the thousands. Yeah, and sure. Top end uh, rare tin of tobacco, like actually probably like cigars, can run you into easily hundreds of dollars. Um, so it's it's all about your um, how much you're willing to invest into the hobby. Um, but I guess some basic guidelines would be you probably want to have at least I'd say at least three pipes um, in terms of, like, number. Um, probably one for aromatics if you smoke those. If you don't smoke aromatics, you can go down to two, one for Englishes and one for non-Englishes. Um, because Latakia, which is one of the components in English tobaccos, um, can ghost your pipe up um, more so than any other single component in a pipe tobacco. So most people suggest uh, one pipe for Latakia and one pipe for Virginias and other Burleys or whatever that can be that pipe. In La terms of, it's not Latakia? They, well, there's different... I think like it's about 50-50 people say Latakia or Latakia. I like Latakia better. It sounds more foreign and yeah, mysterious. I think, uh, I'm... I don't know. I'm under the impression that Latakia is like the actual way to pronounce it in. I'm not okay. sure what language it is, but um, from where it originated in the Middle East, um, and I think Latakia may be kind of like you know pronouncing. Uh, I don't know Milan, Milan, or something right, like right. that. 
so, yeah, I mean, so you probably want to go for two pipes, and I'd say you can get a very good quality smoking pipe um, if you want to, well, if you don't want to get an estate, uh, which most new guys are kind of, I find, shy away from getting estates, myself included, um, for probably around, I want to say around 100 to 150 dollars each. Okay. I'll probably, if you want to just like make a good starting investment and have a pipe that you're never going to ever have a problem with in terms of poor smoker or uh, you know like shoddy stem work or whatever, um, I think a good place to shoot for is around a hundred to hundred fifty dollars a pipe, and at a minimum two and maybe three if you smoke aromatics. Okay. So I think saving up for that level. And then the, that opens up another Pandora's box when it comes to which one to get at that price range because there are a million and one different pipes you can get in that price range. So, well, let me ask you because we had um, Grant Babson on you know show last show two weeks ago, and he obviously makes some very expensive, very crafty, but very 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 sexy pipes. Um, you know, I'm going to ask you as a consumer who doesn't make pipes, or maybe you do. I don't think you do. Um, what is the difference from from a smoker's point of view? You know, because obviously Grant, love the guy to death, but, I mean, he makes a craft product, you know, so he is very passionate about it. From a smoking standpoint... Very, very, very artisanal. Very artisanal, exactly. Artisanal cigars. Right. Uh, John Huber, there you go. I used your, your tagline, sue me. Um, but between, like, say, you know, a $50 or $100 Savinelli versus his five or $600 pipe, what can you expect to get? What is that money, extra five hundred dollars, buying you, other than the rarity of it? Um. Well, I guess the you know it, from watching what he was saying, he was pretty spot on when it comes to uh, you know like uh, stem work. Um, this pipe is actually made by uh, Jared and uh, Jared and John of J and J Pipes. Um, Jared Coles and John Close, uh, and this is one of their older pieces, so it's not necessarily representative of, I guess, their newer stuff. But um, just to, I'm just kind of using it to show you uh, what, like, you know, like the stem thickness, uh, usually with a higher end pipe, will be thinner as opposed to. Uh, let me see. I actually have a Savinelli next to me, so I can do some uh, direct comparison of sorts. Um, so, like this one. Is a Savinelli pipe that's that'll run you about forty, fifty bucks, something like that. Um, and the thickness of a bit of a pipe that'll cost, you know, probably at, from a couple hundred up to you know many more hundreds, um, will be thinner usually at the bit. And you can kind of, I don't know if you can see it here, but yeah. the one on the right is noticeably kind of thicker yeah. than the one on the left. And even the one on the left, these guys have improved their stem work. So from here, it even gets better. Um, but the thinness of the stem is a big one. Uh, the bite, the bit area over here um, is a little bit more def defined. Um, each pipe maker has their own kind of uh, bit area. So this isn't something that's going to be uniform throughout each artisan pipe that you see, but it will generally be thinner. Um, this bit will be more comfortable to either clench in the teeth if you're a clencher or to just stick it in your mouth and, you know, if you hold it in your hand like I do. Um, generally, the quality of the briar will be higher, so I think the generally accepted viewpoint is that... Uh, Higher quality briar means you will have a better chance to have a great smoker. Now, the reason I qualify that is because, um, you know, there are pipes that cost a thousand dollars that are really shitty smokers, and there are pipes that cost ten dollars that are amazing smokers, and people love them, and they only smoke those. So uh, it's not like spending more on a pipe doesn't necessarily give you a guarantee of a great smoker, but it gives you a higher chance of a great smoker. Um, but once you get past a certain point, um, 
past like probably four or five hundred dollars in cost. Once you get past that, um, most of the extra cost is aesthetics, kind of like the green in the pipe. I think Grant was talking a little bit about like a smooth pipe, right? And blast, um, the shaping, the recognition of the pipe maker that made it, the quality of the uh, um, the quality of the shaping and all that stuff. Okay. So when you're making the transition from a pipe that costs fifty dollars to a pipe that costs, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars, you're really the the big thing that they can control is the stem work, and then from that, the briar, you know, presumably will be better shaped. The finishes will be a little bit nicer, and it'll be better briar, so you'll have a better chance of a good smoker. Okay. So that's what that's what you're paying for. Um, and, uh, you know, some people approach it as uh, an investment, you know, and they re uh, resale value is very important to them. So um, some people buy, uh, I, you know, I don't know, one of the well-known Danish pipe makers like a Tom Eltang or whatever because they feel as if, you know, they're very well-known and the pipe will appreciate in value or hold its value like a Dunhill or a Castello, one of those factory pipes that have been around for a while. Um, but that's another perspective from the kind of like the investment val intrinsic value of pipes perspective rather than what will actually give you a better smoker. Okay. So, I mean, I know that pipe tobacco, you know, because I even sent you that thing of, you know, Balkan, how did you say it? Soberani? <laughs> Sobrani? Sobrani. I say Soberane, but however you say it, it. Soberani. Yeah. Um, of the 759 or whatever, and I mean, it was a pouch from, I don't know, 80s, 70s, and dude, that pouch got up to like 250 bucks. I was like blown away. But do pipes appreciate at the same level, or is it more just holding their value? Uh, it depends. Um, right now, we're kind of in a pipe uh, artisan bubble. It's really? Yeah. Just like cigars with craft cigars, were the bubble too. Interesting. Oh okay. yeah, 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 big time. Uh, there are collectors, mostly for the most part, uh, very rich oligarchs in China and Russia, that have just millions and millions of dollars, and to them, buying a five thousand dollar pipe is like pocket change. Okay. Um, so for them, they see pipes as status symbols, for the most part, um, and so. They're driving up the market like crazy, so even the same pipe maker's pipe from one year to another can go up in value right now um, because we're in the bubble, because that's what's happening. Um, but I think it depends on, on the pipe maker. If they're very, if they're deceased and very were sought after in their lifetimes, uh, then yes, their pipes, their pipes can appreciate in value exponentially. Yeah. Um, if they're currently alive and they're raising their prices to go along with demand, their pipes can increase in value a lot. Uh, you know, you can have a pipe that costs five hundred dollars one year, and then a couple years later, that pipe maker has raised their prices, you know, fifty percent, let's say, and so that pipe will go up in value accordingly. Um, but it's a little bit different uh, with artisans that are currently living that you could like contact and get a pipe from um, then let's say a rare tin of tobacco because a tin of tobacco is something that is finite and you'll never see again like if they tin the leaf in the 70s and it's been in a tin since the 70s you know there's a finite supply of that you can't go to the pipe maker or the tobacco company and say you know, give me another tin like that, or go to the store and buy another tin like that. Right. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard. It's kind of like apples and oranges a little bit because it's you're kind of dealing with two very different kinds of things that I guess there's not really, I, I don't know, there's not really any great way to compare them because they're so different. Okay. Interesting. So, I mean, how how are pipes? I mean, I mean, how how do you determine the worth. I mean, obviously, you let the market set the price, right? I mean, if you put up for bid, and it, you bought it for 250 goes for 500 and that's what people bid, but I mean, the market's kind of spoken, right? But, like, yeah. how, how do you know if something's appreciated? Like, for example, 
the pipe that I thought that was like worth a billion dollars and it ended up being worth like, I don't know, a hundred or fifty or whatever. And I mean, how, how, how would you one even go about researching other than asking someone like yourself who's knowledgeable, how would you even go about determining what the worth of a pipe is or how rare it is? Well, the rarity comes kind of with, the rarity is kind of a knowledge thing that you just kind of have to learn when you're in the hobby read articles, um, talk to people. That's the only real way to learn about rarity, I'd say. Okay. Um, but in terms of a pipe's actual value, I mean, I guess a decent barometer is eBay. Uh, sometimes stuff goes on there for way more than, it's, than it should sell for. Sometimes it goes for way less than it should sell for, just like anything else. Um, but it's usually a fair indicator of how much stuff should cost. Um, if a certain pipe maker is still putting out pipes, you can look at uh, retailers uh, where they've sold their pipes. Sometimes they have their own websites. Um, if you're looking for a factory pipe, you know you can find Dunhills on or Savinelli's or Stanwell's or whatever Petersons uh, on the web everywhere. So you yeah. can just go and look at different websites and kind of compare and get an idea that way. Um, but yeah, when it comes to rare, hard to find, more expensive pipes, generally uh, it's all about trying to absorb knowledge from people that know more than you. Uh, and I, I think I'm, I still feel like I know nothing, and I think I know nothing because there's so much pipe knowledge out there that it's impossible to know it all. And there's always going to be someone out there that knows more than you. So it's all, for, at least for me, it's all about trying to learn more. Um, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like Jose Blanco says, is that if someone in relation to cigars says he knows everything, tell him he's full of shit and walk away because there's no way you're going to know everything and that people continue, even Jose who's been in the cigar industry for 40 years, I mean, says he's still learning stuff every single day. Yep. Now, the day that I can tell Jose something he doesn't already know, that's a day I'll probably start jumping up and down, but that probably isn't going to happen, but you know, because Jose freaking knows everything, but uh, he's a smart he is a smart motherfucker. But I, I have a question that's not related necessarily pipes, but because I'm a, I'm kind of a nerd, and I like to experiment. I like to do things for science and just test hypothesis. We've got an ongoing debate here on Cigar Federation, a.k.a. Pipe Dummies, and here's my hypothesis, is the... There's arguments out there, and I've read the Pipe Man's Handbook from front to back. It was quite a good read. Um, and, you know, GL Peace or whatever his name, never met the guy, but says you should always leave your pipe tobacco in tins, if it's in a tin, because it'll age better. And I, my hypothesis is, is that is not true. And I'm actually testing this because I've actually got uh, some Oric, Orlick Golden Slice and some... Uh, McClellan's uh, 5100 Red Cake, or 5100 Virginia, or whatever it is, and I've got some that are in the tins, I've got some in bags, I've got some in mason jars, and then I've got some in mason jars that were sealed and vacuum sealed. But here is my hypothesis. My hypothesis is that tobacco is a, it's an organic and an inorganic process. It's kind of like when you go into space. Like, if you were to go up into space and die, like, your body's not going to decompose because there's no oxygen. You need microbes. You need a little bit of oxygen. And every tin that I've ever opened, when you open it, it's like, because it's all vacuum sealed, right? So my thought is, is that if you put it into a mason jar and you, you, you store it properly, it's not over humidified and it's stored, you know, at a proper temperature and there's not enough, there's no sunlight on it, all those things. It will actually age better and quicker in a mason jar that's properly sealed than it will the tin. I'm curious to hear what you have heard, do you, what your hypothesis is, have you ever tested it, and what is the general consensus from people that you have talked to on the subject? Um, I have never tested it myself, so I can't tell you from first-hand experience, um, but what I've always done is if I open a tin to try a tobacco or whatever, I toss the rest of it in a mason jar, just like I'm sure everyone else does. Um, and if I have a tin of tobacco that I bought or if I have a few duplicates and I want to try one and save some for later, I'll leave them in their original tin. Yeah. Um, 
and just put them, you know, away from sunlight and just in the closet, kind of. Um, and I think that's what most people do. You know, I'll write a date on it to know when yeah. I bought it. Um, or some of them have dates on them already. And uh, I'll just leave them. And uh, I think... I don't know. I think it's it's equal parts like uh, equal parts science and kind of like nonsense because I feel like there is something going on with you know the organic nature of tobacco and the microorganisms and you know the plume that can develop over a long period of time. But it's it's all you know a lot. Like I don't think anyone's really done like an actual scientific study. So I think it's a lot of different opinions that are floating around and a lot of different ways of doing things. I don't think there's one right answer, so to speak. Um, but I can't tell you keeping stuff in Ziploc bags... Not good. ...is not a good idea. You need to keep them either in their tin or in a mason jar um, because Ziploc bags are still a little bit permeable, which is the reason you can... Uh, sometimes, or actually often, smell the tobacco a little bit through the bag. Yep. Um, so I would not suggest keeping them for a long period of time in a Ziploc bag, um, either a mason jar or a tin. Um, I've had some tobacco that came, that I bought in an estate lot that came vacuum sealed, like in those food saver bags. I've seen that. Yeah, and that, that stuff is, uh, when I opened it, it was about... 15 years old, 16 years old, or something like that, and it was dry as a bone, which is not good. Really? Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, if you're keeping it in a food saver bag in a mason jar, that should be fine, I think. But I would not just keep it in one of those bags because they're still, they can still dry out a lot. Semi-permeable. Yeah, they're still semi-permeable. Right? Um, mm. And also another thing I'd say with tins is if you have a square tin, uh, it needs to be checked periodically for leaks because square tins are more prone to leaking really? air and moisture than the round tins that screw either right. the, the flip-top cans or the ones that screw together, like the Dunhill cans. Okay. Um, if you have like a Gowith or a McBaron or whatever that has a square tin, you should be mm -hmm. careful because... They, the seals fail a lot easier on them. Um, and also, I've heard on some tins, uh, rust is sometimes a problem. And rust can also destroy a tin uh, seal. So it's like maintaining cigars. You know, you got to check, check on them every once in a while to make sure everything's good. And um, I mean, luckily, I haven't really had any issues that any horror stories or anything, but I've had some rusted tins that I've gotten estate sales and stuff like that. I don't know. It's not always the best sight to see, but sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's not. It kind of depends. You know. Right. But yeah. So, I mean, no, go ahead. Finish. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, like, uh, you know, like cigars, pipe tobacco can be brought to life, but it's not going to ever be quite the same. Uh, there, are also some, there are also some tins that, like the uh, Solani Silver Flake, for example, comes in this 100-gram tin. That's just kind of like it has a hinge on it, and inside it has a little sticker that holds the hinge down, and inside is actually the tobacco is just in cellophane. Like uh, the Peterson holiday stuff. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, I guess that. Yeah, yeah I took that out and put it in a mason jar. Yeah, that's that I would say is the best way to do it because it's, you know, that stuff, there's no real seal on it, so that you really need to put it in a mason jar. Uh, as soon as possible. Some people say the esoterica stuff, that, like Penzance and Stonehaven. You, you take it out of the bag? Uh, I did uh, when I got, when I like first got my first ever tin of Penzance and Stonehaven. I, out of the, know, the eight ounce bag or out of the tin? Out of the eight ounce bag. Really? Because uh, I've got four and they're just chilling in the bag. Well, I think, well, here's what, yeah, um, Originally, my first batch that I got, I put them in jars, mm -hmm. but I've gotten some since then, and I just kind of have left it. I think it's it's just fine where it is. I Honestly, the first batch that I got, I got it in, and then after a few months, I started reading about people that said, oh, it, it might dry out or whatever. It, you know, there might be little micro, like tiny little pinholes in the bags, so I, so I got scared, so I cut them open, right. 
perfectly moist when I cut them open after a few months in that bag. So I was like, these people are crazy. They're, you know, they're not. <laughs> right. I guess it's possible for the stuff to dry out, and maybe it's happened to people, but it's not. I mean, it's not worth it for me. I just leave them in the bag. So. Just leave them in the bag. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, let me ask you, because I went kind of overboard. I mean, I really got into pipes. Like, Kinda. I mean, dude, you know how I am, though. It's like, you know, I, my wife and I make good money, you know, and just, you know, I, when I get into something, man, I just, you know, I go fucking full tilt, man. I can't help it. You know, so I went from Yeah, zero I don't know anything about that at all. Uh, I don't know. You don't know anything <laughs> about that at all. Like, your thousands of dollars worth of camera equipment. Um, but, you know, I went full tilt. I went from, like, zero pipe tobacco to about, I don't know, 10 pipes probably, and I think I've got almost 10 pounds of pipe tobacco now. So I, here's what I did, and I, wanna, I want you to tell me if this was crazy or not, is my house, I'm, I'm a cheap ass by nature, so I run my house probably 75 to 77 degrees, and we're in Texas, so the AC is running constantly because it's always hot, but right. it doesn't feel hot because the AC is running, but it's still hot inside temperature-wise. And, you know, I did a lot of reading on the Pipe Man's Handbook and all this, and they're like, you know, you really should store your pipe tobacco 65 degrees, you know, 70 to 65, you know, is kind of the right way. Where the cigars for me is, I mean, I might run it, might be 75 in my house. I just run my humidity a little bit lower. Uh, instead of maybe 70, 70, I'll run it at, you know, maybe 65. And, you know, the relative humidity will kind of balance itself out so I don't get mold or beetles or whatever. But I bought a pretty decent-sized wine fridge that's thermoelectric that actually will control the temperature and airflow, and I've got it stocked full of tins and pipe tobacco. And is that a good idea or a bad idea to try to maintain clim like the climate that the tobacco needs to be in? Um, I think it's unnecessary. Um, I think so it was a stupid tobacco. purchase, okay. Well, well it's... <laughs> I, I know some people like to keep their tobacco, their pipe tobacco in like a kind of a controlled situation, but I've found that, you know, I live in New York, so we have all you the... You have extremes. extremes. You have extremes, yeah. yeah. In, the, in the winter, it gets to be bone dry and frigid. In the summer, it becomes like uh, the Amazon. You know, it's it's yeah. hot, it's humid, it's disgusting. Um, and I think mason jars do an extremely good job of keeping the tobacco where it should be, and in that way... Pipes are a lot easier to deal with than cigars because yeah. you you put the tobacco in the jar, you close the lid and make sure it's sealed tight, and then you forget about it. You, know, you put it in the closet and you forget about it. And that's actually the part that I like the most is that I never have to really check on it. I know that if it's sitting in the mason jar, it's always going to be fine. Um, so I think as long as you're not leaving it like out to bake in the sun outside or something, if you have it in your house, and you put it in your closet, I think it should be fine. Um, I mean, people may disagree with me, but I think, you know, it's it should be fine wherever you keep it in your house. Really. Okay. Unless so the wine fridge was not necessary? Well, unless you're keeping it somewhere that's not otherwise temperature controlled. If you're keeping it in, you know, like an attic that's not, well, true. you know, or, or like a basement or something, then obviously there might be problems. But if you're keeping them in your living area that is temperature controlled to room temperature or whatever so you're comfortable, I don't think there should be an issue. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. Well, and that's what I was freaking out about because, you know, I didn't want, you know, and, and part of the reason is I wanted to, in my little aging test, is I've got little tins of everything. So I'm planning on opening one up at a year and then one up at two years and three years, and then sending out samples to everyone who watches the show and doing kind of like a blind sample, which I'll definitely include you on, um, and just let you pick and say, which one do you think, how do you think these were stored? Which yeah. one do you think is darker? Which one do you think looks better? Like, and just let the mat, let the let the data kind of guide us, right? I think it'll be very interesting, but, um, but those samples are going to stay because I'm keeping it, like, perfectly humidified and, like, perfectly, like, 65 degrees. But anyways, Surgeon, do we have any audience questions? Because I'm just over here geeking out. In yeah, that's cool, man. We, we definitely got audience questions. Okay, so, Josh, a couple. I'll hit you up. Uh, i got a good question from uh, Harley Holmes. He's always good for a question or two on our show. And he wants to know, pretty simply, uh, what is currently trending, in your opinion, in the pipe world? Um, the big thing that's trending right now is um, 
artisans making affordable lines of their pipes. Uh, that's a very hot topic right now. Um, and what I mean by that uh, is artisans that normally charge probably five, four, five hundred dollars plus for the most part uh, for their regular, you know, their handmade pipes are now entering the market increasingly. Uh, every, like so many pipe makers are entering the market right now with lines of affordable quote-unquote affordable because it depends on, you know, like I said, your definition of affordable is maybe different with how much you make or whatever. Um, but a more affordable pipes that run from $100 to, like, maybe $250, $300. Um, and that niche market is really blowing up right now because it's the affordable lines of pipes were kind of, it's kind of come about more into the consciousness of pipe makers since the balloon, the bubble has gotten bigger and regular production pipes have gone way up in price. Um, and as the Instagram pipe movement has exploded as well, which introduced a lot of uh, carvers that are newer um, and that haven't, you know, that are starting to put their stuff out there on Instagram. And a lot of those carvers are, you know, uh, you know, within their first year or two of pipe making, if not less, some less, some a little bit more. Um, and they're putting stuff out that generally is about like 150 to 250. So this the market, I think, of the some of the more established, more expensive carvers putting out more affordable lines uh, are trying to compete in that same space. Um, and so what they do is, uh, one example is Chris Morgan. He has a line of pipes uh, that are that he designed and that are completely made by a factory in Italy. They cost, I think, around $100 somewhere. Uh, there's uh, Jay Allen pipes, and uh, he's a very high-end pipe maker. His pipes start at, on the low end, I think, $800. Good uh, Lord. He's, a, he's another guy that's been really driven by this bubble. Uh, he has a lot of clients in Russia and China that are paying stupid money for his pipes. Uh, and so he has just started a line of pipes that's, um, that he designed, the shapes he designed. They're started as stumbles that are turned in a factory in Italy, along with stems that are roughly shaped. Um, and they are sent to his brother in Pittsburgh, who hand finishes them and hand does them to his specifications, and they sell for like 175 to 300, with most of them being, I think, 175 to 250. Uh, Trevor Talbert, he's been one of the guys that's been doing this for a long time. He has uh, a, a, like tons and tons of stumbles that he got, with, and the stumble is the, the wooden part uh, of the of the pipe, basically from here to here, you know, from the edge of the bowl to the you know, mortise tenon connection. Um, and he bought a lot of stumbles and stems from an old factory in France. And so for years, he's been kind of putting out these pipes that are in the $130 to $200 range for the most part um, that, you know, just require him to go ahead and finish, you know, the shaping and he does the finish like he does. Uh, you know, he does some whatever his finish is, and uh, he puts uh, he finishes the stem and cleans up the the bit to his specifications and puts the stem which is has been started for him, so it doesn't start from an ebonite rod. Um, and he finishes that up and he sells those pipes for about one thirty to two hundred. Um, so those are three kinds of examples of how it's done. Um, so there are a lot of pipe makers. Chris Asquith is another one that does a line of uh, hand-finished pipes that's kind of along Trevor Talbert's uh, lead with the machine stumbles and the machine stems, and he finishes them to his specifications. So theoretically, they should smoke uh, very similar to his higher-end pipes. Uh, those also are run from, I think, $100 to $175 or something. So there are a lot of these guys that are coming out with new lines of pipes that are trying to corner this market for 
someone that wants the qualities of an artisan pipe with the slotting, I think like Brent was talking about, funneling the slot here, um, you know, the thinness at the bit, uh, you know, comfortable smoke, uh, one that will have the mechanics, you know, is drilled on perfectly, um, that uses good quality materials for, you know, that, that price range that would be below normally what they would sell their completely handmade pipes for, but above the quality of a factory pipe, which would be, you know, for the most part, you know, your Savinelli's, your Peterson's, your Stanwell's, etc., which would cost, you know, $100 or less. Uh, so that's that's a big one. It's, it's exploding right now. A lot of pipe makers are coming into that space. Um, they're using different ways of, you know, finishing them, uh, different methods of starting the work so that they don't have to, you know, most of the work is, a lot of the work is in the stem. You know, if you're going from a rough briar block as opposed to one that's been started by a machine and finished the rest of the way uh, by a person. Um, so it's, yeah, that that's exploding right now. And then there's, uh, you know, there's a guy like uh, Old School Pipes on Instagram, and he has an Etsy page. He does also does pipes that actually are completely handmade from the raw briar block uh, and he even hand cuts his stems from the rod material. So he does a completely handmade pipe for a hundred dollars to hundred thirty. So he's a great value as well. Um, very good quality pipes. I, I had one of his. Uh, it smoked very well. Uh, I, I had to get rid of it unfortunately, but not because it didn't smoke well. Um, so yeah, that's that's a big. It's a big one, especially with you know the upper end pipes going through the roof in price. Uh, this is going to be, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in this space, um, especially because pipe makers, some pipe makers have been doing this, have done this in the past, uh, with kind of limited success, but then again, for the most part, when they were doing it, the pipe market isn't as big and as, you know, isn't, wasn't exploding to the point where it is now. Um, so it'll be interesting to kind of come in see in a few years who sticks around and who doesn't and what happens with that whole thing. Um, yeah, very hot topic. Very hot topic. Nice. Well, going in a completely different direction here, we have a really good question from uh, Ron Sverdis, and Ron says he's been smoking pipe for about two years now, and this is a good question because I have the same question, which is, uh, when do you know that you're only smoking ash? He says, usually he quits a bowl because it's either too hot, he's just simply had enough, or um, really can't keep the, the rest lit, and uh, usually he finds when he clears the uh, pipe, he is finding a little bit of unsmoked tobacco left. Do you, uh, do you have any suggestions, any pointers for that? Um, well, for me, I think there's always a little bit of dottle at the bottom. Um, I never smoke it all the way to the, like, all the way to the very bottom where there's only ash. I know there's some smokers that like to do that, they consider that the hallmark of a good tobacco or a good pipe, but I always leave a little bit at the end because for me, once you get to the very end, it's kind of unpleasant. Um, and pipe tobacco costs so little that I don't, you know, for me, it's not really that big of a waste to leave just like a pinch of tobacco at the end. Uh, especially because once you get to the end of the bowl, it's kind of absorbed a lot of the, uh, the the moisture from the rest of the bowl, and there's ash on top. And I don't think it's I don't see it as a problem personally. Um, but yeah, that's. Pretty much when I feel like I'm at the end of the bowl is the same as, as you guys. Uh, you know, if I can't keep the pipe lit, uh, if there's a you know pretty good layer of ash on top, um, and it's starting to taste a little bit different than the rest of the bowl did, usually a little bit ashier, a little bit at, more acrid. Um, you know, I usually call it a night or whatever, call it a day, call it the end of the bowl. If I want to smoke another bowl, I'll pick up another pipe and put more tobacco in it. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I think everyone, you know, just like with everything else, you know, there are a million different ways to do it. So that's just the way I do it. Um, but yeah. And I guess as I mean, basically, as you said, like it's not like you're, it's not like cigars. You're not paying five dollars a bowl to smoke tobacco. But you I mean, still don't talking. smoke a cigar all the way down to burning your fingers, or maybe you do. But that's right. How many people I, do that? I do. I, I, you do? 
No, absolutely not. not. I, I stop at like the one inch, maybe one inch and a half mark sometimes. Yeah, I like depending that. On, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if I'm really enjoying a cigar, I go down to maybe like the length of my fingertips, so maybe yeah. half an inch yeah. at the most. But I, you know, rare, rarely. Only one. And the same thing with pipes. If I'm really enjoying a bowl, I want to keep going. But for the most part, there's no reason to. Just because there's so much tobacco out there, and really, I mean, when you break it down, uh, an average 50 gram or two ounce tin costs maybe 11 or 12 dollars, and you're getting, I think, on average about maybe 15 to 20 smokes out of it. So it's costing you less than a dollar per bowl. So I mean, the amount of tobacco you're throwing out at the end is maybe a dime, a nickel. If you're Stuff. buying even less, so it's not it's not worth it to me to have. Not if you're dropping plus. eighty dollars plus in a pipe, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would agree. You know, is it worth? I mean, because I mean, me and my pipe, I and mean, just me and my pipe hobby. If you had the coin, and you were gonna go buy like a pipe that was like a showpiece, and let's say you want to spend five hundred. To six hundred dollars, would you buy a Dunhill or would you buy something different? I'd buy an artisan pipe. Okay. Um, I I was also a person that started out when I went when I wanted to get some high end stuff. I started out getting a few Dunhills and Costellos, and because those are you know names that everyone knows, um, they've been around for a long time. Uh, they'll hold their value well just because of the name recognition, if nothing else. Okay. Um, but for me personally, I've come to appreciate the uh, the artistry in a handmade pipe, um, one that's made by you know a truly good pipe maker, um, which can be even dodgy at at that price level. Honestly, there you know there are some pipe makers who are more worth it than others, even at that price level, in my opinion. Uh -huh. um, so. Yeah, for me, for me, it'll be an artisan pipe. Um, uh, but I, I can see the appeal in Dunhills. I mean, like, I, I like Dunhills. I have a, f a few Dunhills. I like them a lot. Um, but I'm not... You know, one, one tip I will give is that if you're going to buy... If you really do want to buy a Dunhill or a Costello or one of those really high-end factory-made pipes, which is what, you know, they're made in a factory, really... Um, I guess what I'd call them to distinguish them from an artisan pipe made by some dude in his you know, garage. Yeah. yeah. Um, is go to a European website and buy from them instead really? of an American website because for the most part, especially with the euro being so low right now, the euro I think the last time I checked was a dollar thirteen. Oh, uh, is it is it that low now? Yeah, so oh, it, wow. it was a dollar thirteen, and uh, you know they don't pay the different. A lot of times when you're buying it in Europe, you won't have to pay the VAT. So the retail price, including VAT in Europe, will be very similar to the retail price here before you pay tax. So you save pretty much at least twenty to twenty-five percent. Um, on those pipes if you go to a European uh, online shop or something, buy from there. And that's that's if you want a Dunhill or a Costello or one of those like higher-end factory pipes. Uh, if you want an artisan pipe, the difference is maybe a little bit uh, smaller. But, yeah. Got it. Okay. That's good advice. So, okay. I'm going to have to check it out because I really... I don't know. These Dunhills keep staring me in the face. <laughs> I mean, they just look good, man. There's something about them, man. I don't know, man. Oh, I know we're gonna pipe, you know? I mean, I know. They, they are the classic, you know, they're the classic. Most people, when they think of a pipe, they think of a Dunhill. You know, I mean, I love Grant Batson's pipes, but I think if you ask the average Joe on the street, what do you think of when you think of a pipe, he's probably thinking of something that looks like it's a Dunhill rather than one of Grant's pipes, you know? That's so, probably true. There's something intrinsically appealing and classic about them that's, you know, that's stood the test of time for a hundred years, you know? So 
there's definitely something to be said for, for the shapes that they come out with. Um, you know, some of them are classically theirs, and just they, they do it very well. Uh, they, you know, they do it very well. I mean, people will debate whether they're worth the price they charge. Uh, you know, now there are rumors that they're not completely made in the Dunhill factory anymore, that uh, the stumbles were, are turned um, in Spain, actually, and then sent to the Dunhill factory in uh, England to finish. Uh, right. So that they're not completely made from block and rod or whatever in the Dunhill factory anymore. Um, but they, you know, for the most part, they do stuff very well. So, I mean, you know, I think if you can afford it, you know, why you should have a Dunhill in your collection. Why, why not have it? Sold me. All right. Go, go to, go to uh, smoke, uh, smokeking.co.uk or uh, the other one is, uh, I think, just smoke.co.uk. Um, if you just Google, like, one is the James Barber tobacconist who has a really good selection. I've heard they have um, a, you know, they're they're really close with the Dunhill people, so they get really good pipes. Um, and yeah, just definitely go buy from either one of the UK retailers or one of the European retailers right now. It's that's the best way to do it. Don't go to an American site. I mean, as much as I want to support, I love buying American artisan pipes. I buy my tobacco from American retailers, but pipes, European factory pipes, they're not always the best prices at American uh, retail. Huh. I'm going to have to check it out. I'm already on smokeking.co.uk. Looking at the Dunhills, man. You got me got me excited. Dude, they're just sexy pipes. But, um, you know, what I find interesting about, uh, you know, pipes and everything, I find just really interesting is that cigars, you know, I gravitate more towards boutique cigars and small production stuff, and I don't go towards not mass produced, but or you know machine made, but you know stuff that's a little bit more mainstream and stuff like that. But it's weird with pipes. I'm like totally the opposite. Like I'm not really. I mean, I love Grant Babson. I mean, like I said, he was a cool dude, but I don't see myself running out and buying a Grant Babson pipe if I had a choice dollar wise. I'd go buy a Dunhill. So it's weird to me. While I mean, I think it's weird that I gravitate more towards the classic, and maybe I just foresee pipes as being, like, a classic thing and cigars are hip. I don't really know, but it's just weird that you're right. Like, you know, there's definitely a, a, a sect of people that would go kind of boutique or artisan pipes, but for me, I'm, like, totally the opposite. So that is fun that we're... Yeah, there are, I mean, there are people who will only buy Dunhills or uh, people who only buy Petersons, you know, and then there are people... Uh, you know, like my friend Crimson Red over on the Reddit forums, uh, he only buys American artisan pipes for the most part. I mean, that's right. he'll only buy, you know, like he wants a certain look, a certain finish that he gravitates towards, um, and he'll buy only those. So the great thing about, you know, and, and you'll, I guarantee you, in a year or two, your taste will change. If you stay with pipes, you're going to be liking something different in a year or two because I certainly have changed the way I look at pipes in the last couple of years from when I started. So, and I think everyone goes through phases where they like one shape or they like one maker or they like one kind of tobacco and it's always shifting and the good thing is right now I've heard from a lot of people we're in kind of a golden age of pipe tobacco at least luckily here in the US where pipe tobacco is very affordable. I think probably the most affordable of anywhere in the world. Uh, we have the best selection of uh, tobaccos as well from all kinds of different companies producing tobaccos. So the good thing is is that there are an infinite amount of combinations of a pipe and tobacco and you're going to find yourself liking a million different things at different times. So it's always changing. Yeah, I would agree. You're right. I mean, my taste will probably change. Um, I mean, I'm curious because, I mean, is pipe tobacco really that much more expensive overseas? Because pipe tobacco, I mean, if you know anything about, you know, what might happen to cigars with, the, you know, the, the deeming regulations with the FDA, I mean, pipe tobacco was already taxed fairly heavily in comparison to cigars, right? Like, I mean, even in Texas, the, the tax on cigars is a cent or two, and per cigar... 
where you know OTP other tobacco products is like a dollar fifty an ounce or something crazy. Like it's absurd. So even in the U.S., it's taxed much like cigarettes. It's very high. But is it really taxed that much higher overseas? Like where it's not two to five dollars an ounce? Is it like double, triple that? Your average tin uh, in Europe. That let's say Orlick Golden Slice is a good example. Mm -hmm. uh, here it'll cost you maybe seven or eight dollars online if Sticks you go to the end. Yeah. yeah, even you know even less uh, if you're um, buying it at a brick and mortar. You're maybe paying eleven or twelve dollars with taxes and everything added to it. Uh, in Europe, you're probably paying closer to. Depending on where you are, 15 to 20 euros. Good lord. And in Australia, I know there are guys on Reddit that are on that are from Australia. Um, that not only will they put just like <laughs> those crazy tobacco warnings and put everything in a generic package with the oh, yeah. disease lung on it, but it's going to cost you fifty dollars, fifty Australian dollars, for a 50 gram pouch of tobacco, which I think comes out to. I think comes out to forty American dollars, um, so that's yeah. And in Canada too, Canada is uh, tobacco is really expensive too. I know don't even is. get sir. He's Canadian, so don't even get him started. Wanna, yeah, you don't you want don't a forty-five minute started. diatribe on tobacco tax, yeah. man. I won't even stop. Yeah, it's it's terrible. I mean, I I feel bad because you know I, I think we have it really easy here. I mean, people complain about pipe tobacco taxes here being too much, but. I mean, shit, anywhere else you go in the world, it's going to cost at least twice as much. If you go to Canada or Australia or one of those countries, it'll cost four times as much. So I think some people don't realize how lucky we have it here in the U.S. where, you know, I can go out and buy a tin of tobacco for the same amount it'll cost me to buy a burger from McDonald's, you know? In some places over there, it'll cost you as much as a nice meal. So right. It's, you know, That's it's true. I mean, I have not been in, like I said, I haven't been in pipe tobacco that long, but... You know, I know tobacco prices with cigars, just, you know, raw fermented tobacco. I mean, just like a pound of Esteli Lajero within the last year and a half has went from, you know, filler has been went from maybe, you know, three to four bucks. Now it's like eight to ten bucks. Like, has pipe tobacco prices gone up or appreciated, you know, kind of in line with cigars or... Has it stayed relatively constant, or you can get, you know, typical bulk stuff, you know, two to three bucks an ounce, maybe four bucks, tens, you know, Dunhill tens, let's say ten bucks or whatever, or is it the price gone up or stay or gone up dramatically, or has it stayed pretty flat? Um, the last like two years, three years. Yeah, in the last two or three years, I think things have been staying pretty flat. Um, okay. I've heard there, you know, I mean, there's some problems with sourcing tobacco, obviously, from places like Syria. Uh, so uh, Syrian, obviously. Yeah, Syrian tobacco has been a condimental leaf. Their Syrian Latakia has been a staple in a lot of blends for a long time. And now, obviously, that supply is gone. So there are some tobaccos that are still being produced with just the stockpiles that they have left um, from them. When did that actually happen? Like, Because I've got some, art, some ash and artisan blend that uses Syrian, as I say, Latakia, as you say, Latakia. Um, I'm gonna say like Takia. That sounds better. But and I've got tens of it because I freaking love that shit. But what was kind of the cutoff point where okay, we know we're not getting the supply of it anymore, but we might have two years stockpiled that we're aging or fermenting or whatever. Like when when's that point where it's gonna run out? Because I need to know how much I need to go stock up on. From what I've heard uh, from Nick Barron which is one of the companies that has an enormous stockpile of Syrian uh, leaf. Um, I think they said that they have five years worth left. Really? Like that. Uh, they make this blend called Vintage Syrian. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, I got a tin that's two years old. I'm so pumped. Yeah, they. I mean, they're they're still making it. So if you you know if you crack that tin and you like it, you should get some more because it won't be around forever. I think that yeah, they'll have like a, I think they have like five years worth left or something in that nature. Right. I don't is know that about the H H vintage Syrian. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. They yeah. So they still have I think the last I heard was five years left uh, of that. Um, and with I mean I can't say with other companies because I haven't really heard. You don't know. Yeah. 
But I think McBaron is pretty much as big as they get when it comes to pipe tobacco companies. So if they have five years left, I'm guessing no one has more than them. And it can only, you know, it can only be less. I don't think anyone has more than five years worth, if I had to guess. But I, then again, I don't really know because I'm not, you know, really in touch with the big tobacco manufacturer. Right. So that would be a tobacco that's eventually going to run out where if you were going to invest in a tobacco, that would be one to buy if you liked it because it's not going to be around forever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that and, uh, I mean, you know, I think Perique was suffering for a little while because I think the there were some problems with, there was like one, I think there was like one farm or something producing Perique for a little while. Yeah. And I, I still am not quite sure, to be honest with you, uh, like what the deal is with it, but I know it's kind of limited, and I know it's very expensive. So I know Perique prices have gone through the roof. I mean, they're still making it, so you can still, you know, it's not going to run out anytime soon. But that's just when it comes to prices of leaf. I know uh, Perique is very expensive just because there's just very limited quantities, and it comes from, like, one like or two. Leaf. Like two farms or something. Yeah, something in something St. James like Parish or whatever. Like it's like way smaller than it used to be. Yeah, which is why uh, you know a lot of companies in their blends, like for example, Three Nuns. When they brought Three Nuns back, it used to contain Perique, but now yeah. it doesn't anymore because it's expensive. You know, so to cut costs, they cut the Perique out and put Darkfire Kentucky in its place. So uh, Perique's a condimental leaf where most Perique blends are gonna. Cost if they have like good quality perique are going to cost a little bit more than other blends just because of the that one leaf costs more. Right. What's Arcadian perique? Because I have seen that use or being used in the new or well, I guess it's Drew Estate Sugi, um, their God series, and I've seen it like there's the Mac Baron HH Arcadian perique. What's the difference? Like because I thought it's kind of like champagne coming anywhere else you can call it champagne but really champagne comes from the region in France and I thought Perique you can make Perique anywhere but it, if it's not from St. James Parish it's not Perique is it just Perique made somewhere else or is it actually a different process or what's the difference because no one's really been able to answer that question for me and I've asked a couple people oh my god I you know I've listened to people tell me about it and I've read about it and I still can't get it straight to be honest with you I know that uh, making uh, Greek tobacco is actually a, a type of burley. Um, so it's a burley that's been processed in a certain way to make the uh, nicotine more bioavailable so that uh, it makes the stuff a lot stronger. And it, it's a way of fermenting the leaf. You know, they put them in barrels. Right, uh, it's all juicy and weird and stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like, I guess, like Tabasco sauce or something like right, that. Right, yeah. Let the leaves sit in the barrels for a while. Um, but it's it's a way of I know it's a burly leaf and I know the perique is you know to make it perique there's a certain process that they do with it with fermenting it with pressure um, but I know there's a bunch of stuff that's not that they call it perique that it's not really perique that it's some kind of like fuzzy process that they do with a different kind of tobacco where they process it a certain way and it's similar to like the authentic perique but it's not quite that. Okay. But to be honest with you, I just like everyone else, I can. It's a very fuzzy kind of thing for me because it's just so complicated, and there are a lot of trade secrets involved and stuff. And someone, so, uh, yeah, yeah, someone who's actually involved with blending tobacco would be able to tell you more than I could. I think. Okay. I know that I enjoy pretty. So, and my palate is not sophisticated enough where I'm really able to tell the difference between. The genuine, like real perique, and the stuff that's kind of that's very close. Right, perique-ish, yeah. Yeah. Need to coin that. Okay. Very good, um, surgeon. I know we're getting up on the hour, and we promised Josh would be here for about an hour. Um, is there any final audience questions that are worth an ask? I know I kind of dominated the show because I kind of geeking out, but I, th I think we kind of blew through the audience questions, but. Uh, Josh, maybe you could tell people where to find the uh, community of our pipes and uh, just a little shout out to the community. Sure, yeah. Um, so we're on uh, reddit.com slash r slash pipe tobacco. And um, we're, we just passed 15,000 subscribers. 
Um, and we always love to have more people come in and contribute to discussion. And uh, it's a very vibrant community and very helpful and welcoming to new pipe smokers. So that's a that's a big thing is that uh, you'll find a lot of people that are that are newer and more experienced um, there and uh, always willing to help. And pipe smokers, for the most part, are very friendly. And, uh, nice. You know, we'd love to, you know, we have a bunch of features. We have our own monthly podcast that we do. Um, we have, uh, you know, guys coming in doing uh, Ask Me Anything. We just had Jeff Grayson of Jay Allen Pipes come in. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, we're always trying to do new things and trying to, Keep things fun. We just did a community review. We do community reviews every month. Uh, so yeah, come and check it out. It's good. I will vouch. Is that I've asked some silly questions, but it's a good place to get some knowledge. It's not completely overwhelming with you know bomb bomb photos and hey, I just bought this or that. It's a lot of good knowledge. Got a lot of good questions answered. People are very friendly, and it's just a good place, man. It's good people. Nice. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in, whether you're listening live through our website, CigarFederation.com, through the Cigar Federation app available on Android or Apple iOS, or whether you're listening through podcast offline. Appreciate you tuning in. Make sure to tune in tomorrow, Thursday, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to have Viaje and Cigar Dojo on. It's going to be a good show, our Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you don't want to miss that, make sure to get your questions in through the Google Plus Q&A app. Josh, thanks very much for sitting in. We're definitely going to have to have you back, and uh, I think we could probably do two, three hours on uh, oh, you and Logan just easily. educating the audience. Easily. Easily. Well, easily. Well, thanks for having me on. It's been a lot of fun. I told you, dude. I told you it'd be cool, man. I told you it'd be easy. You're definitely right. You're definitely I told right. You, I told you, man. <laughs> All right. Sign us off, surgeon. Thanks very much, and uh, make sure to tune in in a couple weeks. We'll be back, and uh, you have your regular co-host, Rob, to keep you entertained. Thanks for listening, dummies.